Methodist Church. Let's worship together. Heavenly Father, we are glad to be here, wherever that might be, whether it's here in this sanctuary, or at home, or in the hospital, uh, a care facility, wherever we are. We're glad to be here because this time and this space is given to you, and we gladly give it and ourselves to you. We look to you for life itself. We look to you for grace that gives us life, that gives us life beyond life. And this morning we give you our praise and thanks for all of your goodness to us. Be present with us, we pray, through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please stand with me and join me in the call to worship, and let's come into God's presence together. <clears throat> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Remember all his goodness to us, and we will lift our praise to him in joy.
Pray with me the prayer of God's people. I'll just give you a little warning. There are several screens, uh, so uh, if you were a little tripped up by the call to worship that had a second screen, uh, we're going to have a couple screens in the prayer. So let's pray together. Holy and merciful God, this morning we bring our confession to you. We have not always taken upon ourselves the joyful yoke of obedience, nor been willing to seek and do your will. We have not loved you with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. You have spoken to us through the needs of others, but we have often passed by unheeding. We have turned from our own crosses and have grieved the Holy Spirit. Let's continue in prayer. But you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Accept our repentance, forgive our sin, make us pure again, and restore to us the joy of our salvation through Christ our Savior, Master and Friend. Amen. The Lord accepts a broken heart, a broken, contrite heart he will not despise. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise, Praise the Lord, Lord for God. all his poundless mercy.
This morning we want to pray together. I want to remind you to keep in prayer uh, the community of Reimersburg. You probably heard about the uh, natural gas explosion there. And we're particularly uh, invited to pray for uh, the United Methodist Church there because their church building and the parsonage is about a half a block from where uh, that explosion was. <clears throat> and also we want to pray, uh, continue to pray uh, for those who are diagnosed with, <clears throat> with uh, COVID. You've noticed from the paper at least that uh, the rate of infection is increasing in our community and so we want to continue to to pray for that concern um, please pray for barb uh, who was diagnosed with covid and also fred who is uh, being treated for cancer let's pray together Lord, we come into your presence with, with joy. We are so glad to be here with you and to know that through Christ we've been reconciled to you and that we can come to you, our Father, through your Son, through his sacrifice. And we don't have to, to come with our own goodness, <clears throat> Although we know, we know that you care what we do, and you call us uh, not just to be good, but to be holy. But, but we don't have to rely on our own merits. We don't have to prove to you that we're worthy. Because Jesus Christ has opened the door, and he is worthy on our behalf. And in fact, he is at your side, interceding for us with his sacrifice saying over and over and over again these are mine father I have purchased them with my own blood and you see us through him we give you thanks father we worship you we come before you with confidence in him. And we ask, Lord, that in that confidence you would continue to be at work in us, changing our attitudes, our, our words, our actions, our life, uh, so that more and more uh, we want to uh, do what you call us to do, uh, that we would love the things that you want for us, that we would love the life, that you are calling us to so that Lord more and more you would make us uh, to be the people that you call us to be wise in your ways careful to follow you and hear your voice joyful in obedience and sure of your mercy to us we give you thanks for these things, Father. We rejoice in your mercy. This morning, we, want to do, we do want to pray for our neighbors in Reimersburg. Um, we know that uh, some people had to evacuate because of the uh, danger. Uh, Lord, we don't know, I don't know what their circumstance might be today, but we pray for them. We pray for that family who um, lost their home. We pray for uh, the United Methodist Church there and other congregations uh, that, that probably have been affected, uh, that you would bring blessing and protection and comfort and uh, encouragement to them. We pray for, specifically for our community, our county, as we continue to watch the number of COVID cases uh, increase. It's been a, a long haul that we have been engaged in watching and um, coping with uh, this infection. Uh, Lord, grant us patience so that we uh, continue to do the things that protect 
one another and ourselves. And not all of us agree exactly how that should be done, but Lord, we pray that you would give us a heart that is, it is open to care for each other. That you would help us to be diligent. And Lord, we pray that you would give us opportunities to see your hand at work in our lives, even in this circumstance. You tell us that you are at work in everything for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So we want to see your work in our lives, in those we love, in those around us, in our community. And Lord, we pray this uh, across our country and around the world because we know that we are not the only ones who are facing this. We pray for our leaders at every level that you would continue to help them to be diligent, uh, patient as they cope with this uh, on our behalf each and every day. We lift before you our country on the verge of an election and we know uh, how divided uh, we have become and this election is, is, uh, brings that division into sharper relief. We pray for the candidates, for those that will be elected and those who will not. We pray for voters, that you would grant us wisdom, guidance, faithfulness to you. And Lord, we pray that you would grant us patience and confidence in you. That you are our Father. That you are watching over our land. And while it is true, elections do have consequences. And those consequences can be great. In fact, they always are. But Lord, it is you that holds our future. Never let us forget that. And in that light, live as responsible citizens of your kingdom. Lord, <clears throat> we lift before you Barb and for Fred. There are others that we're thinking of, Sheridan and Gabe and Jody, uh, John, and still others who need your healing touch, need your your care and protection. We pray for those who are isolated and alone. We pray for those who are discouraged, who have been struggling or carrying a burden, and they do not see the end of that, and they are becoming weary and defeated. We pray, Lord, that you would lift them up and that you would bring alongside of them your faithful servants to encourage and comfort and support. Let us be instruments of grace to those that we know, for those whose path we might cross this week. Hear our prayers for those we love, For those we will never meet, again, Father, we give you thanks that you hear us when we pray because of your Son, Jesus Christ. We rejoice in him, and in his name we come to you and pray together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
The scriptures say, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Let's worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. ask you to join me and pray with me the prayer of dedication. Let's pray together. Father Almighty, I love and adore you with all my heart. Thank you for creating me and redeeming me through Jesus Christ. I offer you my works and actions, my thoughts and intentions, my affections and desires. Accept my prayer and receive the offerings of my life and of the material blessings you have provided to me. Let all that we together give be blessed for your fruitful service and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. This next hymn we're going to sing, well, we're going to read, uh, is um, probably new to you. I don't know this. It's a Charles Wesley hymn. One of the things about not singing them and just reading the text is I get to pick hymns that we have no idea how they go. And so um, I, I want you to look at the words in this hymn. I picked it because they really are really great words. 
And even if we can't sing the tune, we can lift this hymn before God in praise. be seated. Isn't that good? Aren't those great words? Anybody know that tune? I didn't think so. I didn't either. Uh, thanks, choir. You did a great job uh, introducing that to us. When we, when we start singing again, we will have to uh, add that one to the hymns that we know. This morning, I want us uh, to turn uh, to a section of Proverbs Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27. Some parts of Proverbs are divided up into little short one verse, maybe two verses at a time. This is a longer section uh, meant to be read together. Uh, so let's give our attention to it. But uh, I really want us to center on uh, one, one verse within it. So let's give our attention uh, to God's word in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, your word has all kinds of forms uh, for us to uh, enjoy. Uh, there are narratives of great events. There is uh, deep thought and theology, uh, the prophets speak to us in images that stir our hearts to hear your purpose and to do your will. And here, you give us some words of wisdom for life well lived. And I pray, Lord, that you would grant us grace to embrace your wisdom to do what this passage says, to, to hold on to your words, to hear them and, 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 and grasp them and do them so that 
Our mouth speaks in your way. Our hands do your work. Our feet take us in the path that leads to life. And above all, Lord, teach us to guard our hearts. Amen. Um, I want to start by asking um, a question. Uh, do you have a positive outlook on life? Or are you um, either Eeyore or Oscar the Grouch? Anybody want to admit that uh, you're Oscar the Grouch? I didn't think so. I know people who are. So do you, don't, don't you? Yeah. Um, I heard this week a sermon um, by Dr. David Jeremiah, who was a pretty good preacher. And, um, and he, he argued, and I think he's right, that Christians can and should be uh, among the, the happiest, most positive people in the world. Um, and, and yet sometimes we are not. And that's to be expected because Christians, like any other group of people, have trouble in their lives, uh, struggle with things, face grief, uh, and worries, and so it's not a surprise that, um, that we're not always happy. But that's a little bit different than having a positive outlook. Um, Second Peter 1.4 says, We have God's great and precious promises. And so we can hold on to those and live by them. And so um, I want to borrow some of the things that Dr. Jeremiah said and, and share them with you. I'm not going to say everything he said, and I'm going to say some things he didn't say, but I'm, I'm borrowing some of his points, uh, and I want to share them with you. Um, I want you to start with this thought. Abraham Lincoln said, we can complain because rose bushes have thorns, or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. Isn't that an interesting thought? Isn't that a great way to look at it? I never heard that before until, until I found it this week. Um, it's an interesting thing to keep in your mind. There are thorns in life, but God does bring us roses as well. Uh, so being positive is not only good, it is also important for Christians. Jesus said to us, to, said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. And some of the time we live uh, like dark clouds hanging over other people's lives. Uh, as if we are blocking all the light instead of adding light. And so... Um, we want to think about, I want us to think about together, um, having a, a positive heart. It's something that we can have. It's something we can learn. Some of us uh, seem to do that more naturally. And, and some of us have to work at it a little bit to get there. But we can learn to have a positive heart, a positive mind. And uh, so the first thing I want us to think about is um, if we're going to have a positive mind, we need to be positive in our convictions. Positive in our convictions. A conviction is a fixed belief, a deeply held core of certainties that lodge at the center of your mind and heart. A fixed belief deeply held core of certainties lodged at the center of your mind and your heart. And if we have that kind of conviction, that positive certainty at the center of our being, uh, that tends to, to percolate up and out of our life. What, what did Proverbs 
uh, 4.23 say, guard your heart, because from your heart flows all the issues of life. So if we have at that center this core, then what's going to flow is going to be positive. Um, there's a lady named Florence Chadwick, um, who was 34 years old and had already become a famous distance swimmer. She was the first woman to swim the English Channel. Penny's nodding her head. She's heard of her. Of course, Penny's a great uh, sports fan. Um, and in uh, July, July the 4th, 1952, she stepped into the water off Catalina Island to swim the 21 miles from Catalina to the California coast. 21 miles in open water. Um, the water was numbingly cold. Her escort boats had to drive sharks away to protect her. Um, and on top of that, there was a dense fog that shrouded everything, made it even hard for her to see the escort boats that were around her. That's how dense the fog was. After about 15 hours, she told her crew that she couldn't go on any farther. And they uh, encouraged her. They, they uh, wanted her to keep going. Um, and she labored on. Uh, but at 15 hours and 55 minutes, she had to be pulled out of the water. And she quit a half a mile from shore. When she was talking to reporters later, she said, I'm not excusing myself, but if I could have seen land, I might have made it. See, it wasn't the cold or the sharks, or even the fatigue. What finally defeated her was the fog. It, it shrouded her goal, and it blinded her. Not, not just her eyes, but her heart. Two months later, she stepped into the same water for the same swim. The water was just as icy. The sharks were still nearby, and again, the fog shrouded everything. But this time she swam with her faith intact. She believed that beyond the fog lay the land. She was not only the first woman to swim the Catalina Channel, but she beat the men's record by two hours. Think of that. Now, what I want to suggest to you is that Christian convictions have the same kind of impact on Christians. Um, they help us see beyond the fog to the land, to the promised land. Um, they help us to see through time to eternity, from mortality to everlasting life, from the, the kingdom of this fallen world to the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And if we can see those things, if those things are at the depths of our heart, if our soul is not blinded, well, then that's going to, isn't that going to percolate up and through our lives and, and impact us and others? Uh, there are two things, at least two things. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible we ought, to have, we ought to have drilled deep down into our being. But here are two that are essential to start with. And the first one's really simple. God loves you. Now, you know that. You've heard that probably all your life. But this is not God is love, although that's true. And I'm not saying that God loves everyone, although that is also true. I want this to be personal to you. God loves you. He has picked you out of the crowd, and he loves you. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Paul wrote, I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, 
neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Paul wrote that to the entire church, and so, of course, he used plural pronouns. He says, separate us and our Lord. But his point is personal as well as universal. And you can see that from the beginning. I am convinced, he says. This is personal. And we need to make that truth personal to us. See, Paul says, I'm convinced. That means that at some point he made some kind of a pilgrimage from some measure of doubt to conviction. And we can make that same pilgrimage. And I think we can do that if we change the and make them personal. I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, if the first is true, isn't the second true? If the plural pronoun is right, isn't the singular pronoun right? And, and if this is true for Paul, can't it be true for me? That I can be convinced? I might have a measure of doubt right now. I might not be entirely convinced of what that says, but can't I become convinced? Can't I embrace this to build a solid conviction for my life? So I want you to sit, read this with me. And I want you to read the personal pronouns singularly. So let's read this. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus my Lord. Isn't that good? Do that with me again. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus my Lord. If we work on positive convictions, it will help us to have a positive outlook. Wrong button. And since God loves you, uh, He's got you. He's got your back. He's got your past. He's got your present. He's got your future. And so, uh, 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy uh, ver chapter 1, verse 12, uh, Paul is writing and he says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. It's, it's that same word again. He's convinced, he's persuaded that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. And that day is the day when he comes back. He's, he, he, Paul says, I've given everything over to the Lord Jesus because I know him. And I am certain that he's able to hold everything that I've entrusted to him safe for me until the day that he comes back. I don't know if you've ever been to the seashore with your cell phone, um, but doesn't that create a kind of a problem? Uh, you bring your blanket, you bring a little bag of stuff, and you got your cell phone, and then you decide you want to go in the water. What do you do with your cell phone? You can't take your cell phone in the water. You don't want to take your cell phone in your water. Do you want to leave it on the shore? Not really. I mean, my cell phone, I have... Well, last time I changed phones, the, the guy who was helping me switch the data from the old phone to the new phone said, I haven't seen anybody that had more phone numbers in their phone than you. That doesn't mean I call everybody, it just means whenever I have a chance, I just put them in there. Everybody I meet, I just put them in there. It's got my calendar in it. If I don't have my phone, I don't know what I'm doing. It has messages. It has my email. It has my weight. And the list of medications that I take. If I lose my phone, I don't 
I think I would lose myself. Ah, that's a bit of an overstatement. Now, what do you do with your phone? To whom do you entrust it? That, well, that's, the, that's what Paul was saying here. I've, I've given everything to Jesus. And I believe that he's holding it safe for me so that when I come up out of the water, he's going to have what I gave him and he's going to give it to me. Isn't that good? Now there's something that we can learn and allow to build positive conviction in our soul. One of the steps to being having a positive outlook, to learning a positive heart, is to hold positive convictions. Now you might be thinking, that's a little too simple, but I want to tell you, if these things are true, shouldn't that make a difference in the way we look at life? If God's great and precious promises are really real, shouldn't that make a difference in the way we look at life? See, the problem is not with God, it's, it's with us struggling, because we're not persuaded, we're not convinced. And so we need to work these things into our hearts. So the first thing we need is these positive convictions. But the second thing we need is positive conversation. It's very often that our words uh, to ourselves and to other people undermine what we say that we believe. Derek Kinder wrote, Superficial Habits of Talk react on the mind. Cynical chatter, fashionable grumbles, flippancy, half-truths, barely meant in the first place, harden into well-established patterns of thought. Isn't that true? Um, this morning, uh, I was out in the hall and uh, uh, Sandy was taking your temperature as you came in. And that thermometer reads Celsius. Um, and so she was asking me, you know, what temperature is a fever in Celsius? Because I don't even know what human temperature is supposed to be in Celsius. So we have a paper out there. We looked it up. And then another a member of the church came up and, and uh, was going to uh, try to change it. Said, said these things can be set so that they read Celsius or Fahrenheit. And so that person was working away at it and didn't seem to be making a whole lot of progress. And so I said, don't break it. it. It'll be reading in Chinese or something, and we'll never get it back. Now, I meant that as a joke, but don't we often go, often go toward negative rather than positive? I do. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 Paul wrote, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now that word unwholesome is translated in different translations different ways. Um, it not only means that kind of unwholesome, but it also is used to mean bad or rotten or decaying. So the image is sort of like um, you wouldn't put something that was decaying in your mouth, would you? So why would you let something that is decaying come out of your mouth? So Paul says don't let anything unwholesome come out of your mouth. And the contrast is just as powerful. He says that there are three things um, that our speech should do. It should uh, be helpful. It should build others up. And it should benefit those who listen. Now, if we measure what we say by those, those three simple things, uh, that's going to stifle some of what we say, but also encourage us to say things that are helpful and do build other, us up and are beneficial. You know what happens as we do that for other people? It's going to build us up too. 
We're going to help. We're going to hear that that talk as as aiming to ourselves. We can even bring it back to ourselves and and have positive self talk that is helpful, that builds me up, that benefits me. So we want to have um, positive convictions. We want to be positive in our conversation, and then the last thing, be positive in crisis. Um, Life has crises. Jesus said that it would. In John, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will. It's a certainty. And so part of faith has to be learning how to deal with crisis. Part of faith has to be learning how to deal with crisis. Now, I want to go back to Romans chapter 8, but this time verse 35, just a couple verses before what we just looked at, where Paul asks this question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Um, He asks that question, and then he he gives seven crises uh, to think about. So he says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? What about trouble? Ever have trouble? What about hardship? Will that separate us from the love of Christ? What about persecutions? Now, we may not have experienced that. What about famine? What about needing to meet the bills and wondering if you can do that? What about nakedness, being in want? What about danger? Paul adds, sword. God wants us to have positive heart and positive conviction. And part of it is facing these crises in life. And what he says is, in the face of those, in the face of all that stuff, his answer is, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall these things separate us? His answer is no. In all these things we are more than conquerors. So that we can look at the crisis in our life for an opportunity for God to show us His grace. Doesn't mean it will be easy. Doesn't mean we won't face loss. Doesn't mean we won't grieve. It means that in those situations we are still in the love of God and Jesus Christ. And in that we can face the crisis that come into our life. So what are we going to do? Um, God wants us, I believe, to have a positive heart. And in order to learn that quality, we need to first develop positive convictions. You need to convince your The second thing we need is to practice positive conversation. To teach ourselves to speak in ways that are beneficial and helpful and build build us and others up. And we need to face crises with a positive center. That's a tall order. It really is. And I, when I look at those, those things, I know that I'm not entirely there. Are you? Well, that's okay, because the Christian life is a pilgrimage. We're on our way. We haven't arrived at our destination. So don't be discouraged. Have a positive attitude, a positive outlook that you're going to get there. Uh, There was a post on Facebook that showed uh, a single teenager standing alone at a flagpole, and it seemed that everybody who saw that on Facebook had a comment about him. It was a See You at the Poll Day, which is a yearly event that encourages students to uh, gather at their school's flagpole and to pray for their school, the, their students and teachers and uh, support staff and ad- administrators. And very often, See You at the Poll will, will draw a crowd from the school. But in this particular case, at the uh, Lake Mineola High School, 
only one young man turned out. There he was. He stood there alone praying. And a passerby snapped a photo and posted it to Facebook and, and wrote, I want to commend this young man who stood alone at the Lake Mineola High School's See You at the Poll Day. I welled up with tears, happy tears, proud tears. Please take a moment today to pray for our children, school, teachers, administrators. And then comments began to pour in uh, that praised this young man for his courage. Even people who didn't profess faith of their own uh, uh, congratulated him uh, for standing up for his own faith. And his, his mother uh, got, a, uh, got a text, said, you got to see this, you got to look at it. And, and she went to the Facebook and, and, and realized it was her kid. And she said, the little boy that I uh, rocked to sleep had captured the attention of our community by standing alone for what he believed. She had texted her son, told him he was on Facebook and um, how proud she was. And his name was Hayden. He was as surprised of all, about the attention as anybody else. Um, his original thought was that he'd pray until somebody else came. But nobody else came. And so his prayer became, um, God, as people drive by, let them wonder and let their hearts be pricked. And that happened because of a Facebook post. Now, here's my point. If I'd been that kid, I'd have probably stood there for a while and said, nuts, nobody else is coming. What am I doing here all by myself? Have you ever been to a Christian effort and only a handful of people showed up and you said, why did we do all that work? And what a waste of time. And wouldn't you? Yeah. But see, this kid had a positive heart. He said, well, God might be able to use even this. Let's give it a shot. God do something. And God did something he never would have expected. See, we can have a positive attitude, a positive outlook. And we can learn that. But it is something you learn, which means you have to be willing to teach yourself. And that's what I want to encourage you today. Teach yourself. Positive convictions, positive conversation, positivity in crisis. Let God put a smile in the depths of your heart as well as on your face. Heavenly Father, Thank you that you are a God of great and precious promises. So, Lord, teach us to guard our heart against the garbage that uh, sometimes flows in. Help us to put up a filter that keeps the garbage out. And that's the gospel and your grace and your truth come in and make a home and change us from the inside out. Teach us that we can be positive because we are positively in your hands. Lord, I ask that you would grant us grace for this. In Jesus' name, amen.
Whatever is true, or noble, or right, or pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. The God of peace will be with you. Amen.